So five years ago, she was sitting in her office, which was a fancy corporate office. She had nice colleagues, and the paycheck was really awesome. But um, somehow she wasn't content. There was some, something was missing. And then she realized that this was the content that was missing. And she decided to quit. But um, she wanted to uh, help overcome this, uh, this conflict between uh, the big corporate world and the startups. So she founded Matchmaker. I'm honored to introduce Maya Hansen. Hi, everybody. Um, so good to see that many people here. Usually the second days on the conference are always the tricky ones. I hope not too many of you have headaches from last night's party. And I would like to invite my entire panel up here. Uh, instead of me introducing them, they will all do the introductions themselves. So please. Can I just take the seat? I'm lucky to talk about the corporate and uh, startup <laughs> collaboration. Actually, we are here to talk about the startup and corporate collaboration. Me, myself, as uh, coming from the corporate world in the past four or five years in the startup world, being in and between the both. But now I'd like to give, um, we have agreed, three-minute introduction from each and every one of you. I will be timing you, so okay. no going over. <laughs> <laughs> and so. let's start from here first, Kimmo. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So, degree on philosophy and another one from Design Institute. I have uh, five cats and a bad behaving old dog. I love fencing. Um, I'm actually title holding champion in that uh, Olympic sport in Finland and at the same time also honorary president of the Federation. I know that's an odd combination, right? Usually the champs are 20 years young and the honorary presidents 20 years old and might be needing a role later to move around, but that's another story. I've been uh, on startups uh, for years, working on startups, um, entrepreneur for eight years, and now last eight years in Elisa Corporation, and that has been quite a ride, because the corporation is 135 years old and um, it's for communication services, the business like uh, Vodafone, AT&T, or Telefonica. And that business is going down globally. European telcos revenues are going down one person each year, and that's the reason for change. And it seems we have been doing some right changes. Actually, last three years in a row, we had best results ever in terms of revenues and profitability. And one of the reasons being that we have been creating digital services. At the moment, 15 percent of the revenues, 1.6 billion euros, consists of digital services, and that might be an industry record. However, at the same time, we are convinced that it's only beginning. Only scratching the surface of big transformation happening in all traditional industries, and that transformation, you know it, it's a digitalization, and startup has a key role in that change. It's changing the whole business logic. Everything happens with the speed of light, and sooner than you expect it, a new innovative startup has already done the work, creating an innovative new service. Therefore, for big organization, it's not an option, it's must to do business with startups. <coughs> and that's what we have been doing strongly for years. And we have a clear approach. We want to be an early stage customer or a sales channel. And nowadays we have 77 euro, that kind of partnerships. My role in Elisa Corporation is about those startup uh, partnerships. Another one is, oh dear. <laughs> the panel is over. Minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay, are we in fire? Yeah, yeah. that's too long. <laughs> oh, man. It's so good to see you all so calm. <laughs> we should be running for yeah, the exit, we, you yeah, know? Indeed. I suppose, yeah. <laughs> well? Yeah. Sounds like a school yeah, bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay you yeah. can come back. <laughs> the fire is over. All right. 
Service and your time, you have 15 seconds left. Yeah, we have 15 <laughs> seconds, <laughs> sure. So I was saying it's about startup partnerships, another one is about the research, um, how we identify the next big things, disruptions, and the third thing is the production operations, how we made it efficient. And one more thing I will say is that why we are cool partner for startups, because it's a great living lab, Estonia and Finland. All that we have only 2 million consumer customers, 150,000 enterprise customers. We are small telco, but for instance, in Estonia, e-identity in Finland, the highest use of mobile data than any other country in the world. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> we move on with Antea. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Antea Greco. I'm head of partnership at Waira. I've been working for four years for Telefonica. Telefonica is a big, big Mumbai company. And uh, I was responsible first for advertising products. So I was responsible for funding innovation and working with startups uh, for display advertising. And uh, then I moved to big data in Telefonica. So I moved to Brazil for two years, which was a lot of fun as well. But I was there to launch our innovative big data products in Latin America. And now I'm back to the UK. Uh, I'm Italian myself. And I work for Waira. Waira is a startup accelerator, which is part of Telefonica. Telefonica launched Waira about five years ago because we realized that uh, we were going to die in the market if we were not innovating. And the only way to innovate was to open our doors to uh, external innovation because in the companies, we always think in the same way, with the same mindset. So it's important to work with startups to have uh, a new approach. And Wara um, has uh, 11 academies in 10 countries. So it's in the UK, in Spain, and in Germany, and all across Latin America as well. So far, in five years, we invested in uh, 800 companies. In the UK, in uh, 150 companies. And uh, we look to all digital innovations, so we are not focused on some sector. But myself, I'm head of partnerships, and I focus on creating partnership with other corporates, with the universities, and with the government, because we think that co-innovation is very important as well. So if you work with another corporate or with the government in one sector, then the startups have access to two possible clients, basically. So we have partnerships in the health sector. We have a partnership with the Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company. We have partnerships in the e-commerce sector, uh, having a partnership with uh, ASOS, which is a fashion online retailer. And uh, we have uh, a partnership with the UK government for cybersecurity. So we have a lot of cybersecurity companies as well. And uh, we invest in under 50 companies. We have two main KPIs to measure ourselves. First is uh, the amount of external investment than the company raise, because we have uh, access to a, a great network of investors as well. We invest ourselves, but we push the companies uh, kind of to meet other investors as well. Uh, our 150 companies in the UK, they got 120 million of external investment. And usually what we see is that the first 20% who get kind of more successful. And then the other KPI, which we strongly believe in, is the number of trials and contracts that the companies make with Telefonica. Because for us, the biggest value that we provide to the company is this relationship with Telefonica. Telefonica is a huge company. We do a lot of things from advertising to big data to cloud. Uh, we are in the transport sector, in the public sector. So there are a lot of opportunities for the startups. And these 150 companies, they signed uh, 80 trials and contracts with Telefonica. Uh, globally. So, yeah, I think I was faster than <laughs> yes. it was good in time. Six minutes, but you know the fire took some, uh, some time, so we need to make up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, <laughs> the alarm. <laughs> fire again. <laughs> Another fire. We hand it over to Hendrik. Hello. Uh, I'm Hendrik. I'm from a small island called Hioma. Uh, in Estonia, and I have worked in finance, field of finance, last 15 years, last 10 of this as entrepreneur, and uh, with the help of uh, my lovely wife and Andrus Vivik from AIS, I have uh, managed to set up a new venture called Upgraded Technologies, uh, which enables uh, motivates customers uh, towards regular repurchases. So you would have uh, always latest technology in your hands, and you would have a lot of savings by doing so. Doing so. Uh, during these 15 years, 
most of uh, my experience has been in cooperation with corporates. Lately with Apple, uh, most of the, during these 15 years with multiple banks, in good times and in bad times. And uh, so corporate partnership has been very important or basically enabling me to do what I'm doing now. Uh, and as Maya asked for me, from me, like, uh, how would you define cooperation between uh, startup and uh, some corporate company, large or very large? And uh, I think the definition is very obvious and very simple. It's basically based on trust and knowledge. So it has to involve both of those components without, because without one of the, them, it's meaningless and it doesn't create value. So based on what I've seen, keeping like earning and keeping the trust and having a competence which somehow benefits uh, the counterparty, like the large corporate, of course, they have to be open for that too. But then it's possible, the cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. <laughs> we Hello, move on to the is... next startup, Christoph. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, nervous a little bit, no. Um, I'm coming out of the advertising industry. I'm from Austria. Um, and I've never been self, uh, I've never been employed somewhere, so I've always did go my way. Um, I did my digital agency years ago with the idea of creating something, and it's fun working with people. It's always fun. Most of the time it's fun, to be honest. But at some point, you, you try just to switch from the point where you say, I sell my hour, because you are limited in hours, to something else that can scale. So the idea which we had in mind was, there's the internet. It's mobile partly, like 50% plus. Um, and it seems like everything is for free there. But it's, it's not because there's advertisement. So at any time you see something, you pay for that based on advertisement. Now, the problem is that people who are using advertising are trying to focus on you. Like, if I have a brand, I want to focus on you and I want to sell, send you my message. So I think about it and then I try to get that message straight to you. The problem in the internet is you can't really focus on people because targeting today is something like you try to generate virtual profiles. You surf over, over sites and then you're probably male, sports interested whatsoever, but it's always an estimation. And what I thought was like, how about changing that and switching back to real data? What I mean with real data is not estimating, but knowing who that person is. And I know it sounds creepy in the first step, but how about creating a world where you see an advertisement which directly fits to you? It's not an estimation, it's really what you think about it. So what we tried is, where do we get that data from? Because I don't want to like, follow you on every site you are, I want to figure out who you are really are, like on a social demographic way without storing information, just like knowing at the point where you should see that advertisement. So we tried to figure out where is the person, the company, whoever knows that information. And there's obviously only one, and that's those guys. Um, the MNOs <laughs> knows where you are. They know you are having a contract. They know you're allowed to serve. And before you see anything on a website, they know like everything about you based on a contract. So we figured out a way of creating a, a direct Con, uh, connects between the advertising and the MNO without giving that information to them. So in real time, at any time you go to any website, we know who you are, like let's say 30, 40 male, um, and I could forward that information to the person who would advertise that page, and based on that, on that 100% valid data, they could use advertising which fits to you without storing information, without stalking you, without using virtual profiles. It's just like a link which everybody should know that there could be something like that. And we tried to figure it out. So we work together now with the MNOs using their data because they were a little bit slow in the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, helping them to use their data on the other side, the advertisement side. Because at the moment, or let's say five years ago, they just provide infrastructure. And the people who got money out of that were YouTube, Google, whoever. And now we try to bring them back into the game, doing that link as a data broker from the MNO side to the advertising side. And it, to be honest, it's fun at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, Toby. <coughs> you Thank see you. both worlds. <laughs> yeah, Toby Arvinen, manager partner at uh, Nestholma. Um, 
I think I've looked at the world from, well, most sides of the tables. I, I did my PhD 20 years ago, worked for a large uh, Nordic telco for eight years, run a digital agency for three years, uh, run a startup for three years, and then co-founded Nestholma. And um, Nestholma is, uh, is an accelerator. So we, we help large corporations to work with startups. Uh, really to do business with them, not just to mingle with them at these uh, wonderful events, but really actually go down hands-on, really find something worthwhile that you know, other people are willing to buy. Uh, so we invest in the startups. Uh, we have 35 companies in our portfolio uh, from 10 different countries. We've worked with uh, companies like uh, Microsoft, Nokia. Uh, we've done quite a bit uh, fintech-related stuff with, uh, with Nordia lately. Um, and um, and one of the things that uh, we also want to do, so we invest, we, we help the deals, that the deals are being done, but we also want that, uh, that the uh, big company renews themselves. So we actually, uh, just la uh, lately, we, we used to call ourselves a, a venture accelerator, and we, we said that, okay, well, actually what we do is that we help the big company to re renew themselves. So, so they are renewing their organization with the startup collaboration. So it's a good business for us in terms of investing, but it also, also it helps the big company to learn about the new th ways of doing things, to learn about how their company should be approaching the future, because you know no one knows what the future will hold. Uh, in, in the fintech, for, for example, everyone talks about BSD2 or KYC or all these fancy acronyms. But actually, no one knows what that will actually, ha what the future will hold. And, uh, and, and every big company has to uh, prepare their employees for the future that's unknown. And startups are a great way to do that because they are sort of facing the unknown every day. And, uh, and when you really do the work well with the startup, not just to make a couple of deals here and there, but really, really the big company opens their eyes to, to, to the ways that the startups do things, they can actually face the world in a new way and also improve everything that the company does in other things as well. And the good thing is that the startups will uh, also learn from that because the big companies are there for a reason. They, you know, they are making money. They, they've been able to serve a large uh, population before, so there must be something that the small companies can also learn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a little bit, maybe a brief word, what we do, uh, the slides, um, I'll have a few slides, a few statistics to show uh, about the collaboration. We've now heard all the beautiful things. They all collaborate, they all do it, but is it really that beautiful? Uh, first of all, what you see on this slide is actually the banks. We just finished a study on looking at the European banks, uh, the financial sector, especially banks and insurance companies, and their collaboration with startups. What we found out is uh, when you look at the top 20 banks in Europe, and out of those top 20, only five actually have innovation responsibility assigned on the executive board level. So we could say those are the five that are really committed to collaborating with startups. <coughs> and the outcome there is the ones who do collaborate, what you can see on the slide is that their performance outperforms the peers. Of course, there is many dimensions behind it, but we strongly believe that the fact that you uh, are focused on innovation is one driver of the performance. Another fact from telco space, where we just did a study last year, we looked at all the telcos and did the same kind of study, um, and we looked at their financial performance of the ones ha who have said that innovation is, or collaboration with startups is top priority and then the ones who said it's not top priority. And the ones who say it's top priority, they clearly outperform the others. But knowing that there is potential to outperform, when we now go back to the financial sector and we really start to look what does the collaboration mean, then what you see here is on one side you see the different vehicles that the banks or insurance companies can use to collaborate with startups. It is, you can have an incubator, an accelerator, you could have a corp up, which means you have a contractual relationship with the startup, or you could have a corporate venture capital fund. And on the blue side, you see how many of all the uh, 200 respondents that participated in the study, uh, 200 financial institutions, how many of those said that they use this type of vehicle? Incubator Accelerator, it's important to understand, it does not mean 
that they uh, have their own incubator accelerator. It might mean that, for instance, there is a startup bootcamp incubator, and they mentor in that incubator. So almost half of them are engaged with an incubator or accelerator. Only 17% of them have corporate venture capital, which is quite understandable because it is the most expensive vehicle to engage with startups. But then on the yellow side, what you see there is how deep that collaboration goes. When you look at the incubator and accelerator, then the depth of that collaboration, only 19% out of those 45% that do this kind of vehicle have gone deep in the collaboration. What does it mean to go deep? It means that you really take that innovation and you use it. That you don't do this incubator and accelerator just to put a lipstick on a pig and say, now I look nicer, now I innovate. You don't innovate if you just put money in the incubator and accelerator. You innovate if you take the technology out of that incubator accelerator and you really utilize it either internally in your organization or you pass it on to your customers. And what you can see here on the slide, because the picture goes nicely like that, what it means is that there is really a lipstick on the peak, at least in the financial sector, when it comes to collaboration. They say they collaborate, they talk a lot about the collaboration, but they don't go deep in the collaboration. So my question to the panelists, I know we have a lot of telco people here, is let's start with, with, the, with the telco pe people asking, do you think the picture is the same in the telco space, or is it that it really has gone deep already? Or is the telcos also doing the lipstick on the pig? Do you want to start, Hunter? <laughs> yeah, sure. Now we go to the ugly part, you know? <laughs> Let's be honest here, you know? <laughs> so, um, I can talk a bit about Telefonica and about other companies I work with as well. So, as Telefonica for us, as I was mentioning before, like the real value is the the business development that the companies have, the startup have with Telefonica. Like, we, want, we don't want to do it for PR, because the PR is good for maybe the first year or the second year, but then it won't have any return. So really for us, it's about making those collaboration happening, but it's really hard. I mean, let's be honest, it's, it's really hard because uh, companies have a different pace than startups, because companies are risk adverse, so they, uh, it's hard for them to kind of embrace innovative products. What we do is that uh, in our accelerator, we take very senior uh, people from the corporate, from O2, for example, in the UK. And uh, now our business development manager, meaning that the person who is responsible for putting the startups in contact with the, the relevant departments in Telefonica was before head of enterprise for O2. So we are putting very senior people kind of in our team to make those uh, uh, relationships happen. And this has helped a lot. But when I work with the other companies, it's, it's hard because my job is kind of, I'm head of partnership, so we want to create co-innovation as well. So we want to work with other operators, with other companies in other, in other industries and to innovate together. And what we see is that uh, uh, first, sometimes there is, there is not an innovation department. So it's hard to find those people who will push the startups to work with the corporate. So like, there is no direction, really, from the leadership of the company to work with startups. And then second, sometimes uh, the company just want to work with startups for PR. And other times, they just want to work with startups to resell their solutions. So they're not interested to embrace the product in the company because it's hard, because they prefer to innovate from the inside. They want to work with startups to have a bigger portfolio of solution to offer to clients, which is good for startup as well, but it's kind of, they lose the purpose a bit mm -hmm. of, in, of innovation and of working with startups. So it is challenging, and we've been trying doing this since five years. And uh, we, I mean, we have some number that show that we achieved that, but of course, like, there is room for improvement, and uh, we are working on that. But we try to solve that, putting people from the leadership team in Telefonica into the Wira team, who work for the startups. Another example is that the founder of Waira, five years ago, today is the global CEO of the whole Telefonica. So we do have a strong support from the leadership, but it is important as well uh, to have in the priorities kind of to work with the startups. Okay, so it's not as, as nice as we, we would like it to be. No. There is still a lot of room, as yes. I could hear, yes. which is the same in financial industry as well. 
Okay. How about you from the Th Elisa th perspective? Thank you, Mai. So <laughs> I, I think the, um, devil, is, devil is on details and statistic is as you want to read. So now my question is that those fives of those 20 banks uh, who has nominated a person on innovation, are those forerunners or laggers? Because I, I think it would be a bit strange if you have on the executive board a member um, responsible of being honest, or being responsible of, uh, of um, sustainability or responsible of uh, revenues. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, innovation should be responsible of all executive board members, right? Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we do not have any department of research. We do not have any department of innovation because it's a matrix organization happening all in the organization. And that's really important, and it's important to understand, and it's about the cultural change, something what Topi already said. You can't really outsource <coughs> doing business with startups. You had to do it, you had to renovate yourself and change the culture that everyone is doing the business, not only one person in the executive board, right? Mm -hmm. It's right, but I guess it's, uh, at the end of the day, don't you need somebody to be responsible? Like, everybody in the organization is responsible for finances, but you still have a CFO who needs to, whose head is going to be on the bench at the end of the day if nothing is happening. You have a CEO, COO, all these res responsibilities. Can you really put the innovation responsibility throughout? Because I know you and Hendrik, you have a really nice, ugly truth here to share with us as well, because you've tried to collaborate. <laughs> yeah. so, but, but do you really think you can give this responsibility to everybody, or you still need somebody to drive it, making sure that it doesn't go just 10 hundred different mm. ways, mm. but there is really, sure. somebody needs to keep a focus, somebody mm. needs to say that, yes, we want to innovate, mm. but we only want to innovate, for instance, let's say it's a bank, mm -hmm. we want to innovate, but we only want to innovate in lending space, we don't want to innovate in other spaces. In telco, maybe say, we only want to innovate in front-end solutions or whatever, somebody needs to set the direction, or... Mm. Right, but um, uh, personally, I think, Maya, that uh, banks had to innovate a lot, Think about, for instance, and financing in China, right? It's uh, something owned by Alibaba. Uh, most, uh, you see, over 50 percent of the populations are now having uh, uh, clients of and, um, and finance, and their banks didn't innovate, and now they are losing the track. And the same is happening for telcos if they don't uh, innovate constantly in all their organization and all in their operations. Mm. Okay. Toby well, wants to add, and then I'll give a <laughs> word to Hendrik as well. So, so, so what, we, what we, for example, do, so because I've, I've personally been in organizations like the uh, innovation and sort of uh, internal accelerators and, and, and run those things. So, so I've seen what happens there. And, and, uh, and uh, sort of everyone in the organization, you know, so, so for, for example, Elisa, their business is not to, to, to mingle or to work with startups. Their business is to, to provide better services for their customers. And startups are part of that thing, and so so you have the strategy, you have the uh, your your business goals, and then startups can help you in, in some parts of that, and and sort of the problem usually arises when uh, when you have a specific uh, sort of function that's that's that whose job is to uh, to work with startups, and then they sort of do something, and then they bring it to the business, and you know what do you think? They said, well, I I are, is this really what we are wanting? And then usually there's, there's a gap because they don't really understand the path and, and sort of the, uh, the journey that they have, uh, have been taking. So what we've been doing uh, pretty successfully is that from day one, we bring the business leadership to be there uh, on a weekly basis. For example, um, uh, um, we, we require that the, every startup has a mentor that, that has business responsibility. So, so the business is there every day sort of giving guidance that, okay, these are the things that, that are really important for us. If you want to make a business deal with us, you know, think about these things. And, and, but, the, but the thing is that the reason why they like to be there is that they are learning all the time about the new things. It is just not uh, another startup deal or a startup uh, uh, sort of fixing a bit of a, a sort of landscape that, or the business they have, but they are actually getting a lot of other things out of that. And, uh, and that's why the relationship works. It's not a waste of time for them. They are getting a lot out of it, uh, aside from the uh, potential business deal that may happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes? I have to, like, one, one step before you talk about that, mm -hmm. because the, the first thing we had to learn is their language at all. Because when I started going that direction, talking to telcos, I, like, it, it se seemed like I, I, I spoke a different language. They didn't understand me. The, the, the way I wanted to go to was for them like, yeah, exactly. okay, yeah, no. 
no clue what we were doing, for real. So the first thing, for, from our perspective, like they, it takes longer for telcos to adapt to startups, in my perspective. So we had to adapt to what they think about, where their vision is, how we can adapt to that. And the other thing was, working with telcos is great, but it's like a black box. You don't see into that. So they have a vision somewhere inside, but they won't show you on the outside. So we didn't understand them at all in the first step. We knew there was a business case and, and using something, but like trying to get that together didn't work out. So we, we learned the language. We hired people out of the telco because we didn't understand why they were doing the stuff they did. And afterwards, then we got to the second yes. step, going into the, the corporation. But in the first step, it was about understanding and speaking their language, understanding their needs. Uh, and that, that's, that's where it started from. And it took us a year or two, probably, to understand where they want to go to and adopting to that way, to, to have a vision together. Before that, it was like everybody was talking on his own, not together. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, I still want yeah. to say an audience. If I can add something as well, I think you're both kind of right. So what we see is that from one side, <laughs> <laughs> like from one side, if you don't have any innovation department, then everyone in the corporate world, they need to make money. Like, they don't have to innovate, right? It's not their priority. And they're worried about uh, their daily job. So it's hard to push innovation if you don't have uh, an innovation department. On the other side, if you have a startup accelerator or innovation department, it becomes very far from the day-to-day -day reality. So it's hard to connect those two worlds. So what we try to do, and we are trying to do it more and more, is that uh, when we select startups, we invite, we, uh, invite some kind of senior leadership in the selection process as well. And we assign to every startup uh, a mentor, which is a, a business development, a person from the, the, the leadership team as well. But also, the most important thing is to involve the mid-management, because they are the one who do the day-to-day -day job. So if, if you need to, even if you in, include the leadership, then all the mid-management can block all those conversations. So that's why we have uh, uh, a lot of mentors that coming from these kind of mid-management positions. And uh, I was telling you before about this position of this person who does business development for the startups. His main job is to chase people. He's it, well, doing that every day because even if we get those meetings, even if we get mentors and meet with the startup every month, then uh, the people from the corporate world, they will go back with their world. They have day-to-day -day job activities, they will forget about uh, the startup. As, I mean, it's exciting, but then they count their day-to-day -day priorities. So what you were saying about the pace as well, it is true, like, there is different pace. And it's, it's good to manage expectations from the startup side and to teach them the language of the corporate world and, like, how to talk to them and uh, um, how to be flexible. Because at the, at the end of the day, who, the startup who win, who gets into the corporate, are the ones who are more flexible to the corporate need and are the ones who make the life easier from kind of the corporate world. Because if you come to me and tell me, oh, let me know what your challenges are, I will solve them. You're implying that I have to do some work and to write down the challenges and then to come back to you. Maybe I won't because I will go back to my day-to-day -day job and I won't have time to do that. But then if you do some research beforehand and you tell me, oh, I know this is your challenge, that's how you solve it, then it's a different approach. <coughs> so it's how you approach things as well and how you always try to make life easier of the person you're going to talk to. That's uh, kind of the communication that we are trying to uh, it's a very, push in our It's a very interesting well. point to be, break, bring out is in terms of you all have mentioned the cultural differences between the two, mm. the startups and corporates, and I think that's the reason why uh, the companies like Nestolma and Matchmaker Ventures exist in the market because what we do is we translate one to another. We really, we're, at Matchmaker Ventures, what we do is we match startups with big corporates where there are intermediaries in and between to translate one to another and to really make it a long and happy marriage because in the marriage you need your counseling every now and then as well. So we take the role of the counseling, assuring that really what happens is a long-term uh, happy marriage because the cultures are very different. And what we've also noticed a lot in the corporate side, which you brought out as well, is that even though you might want to spread the innovation throughout, but people have their daily tasks. If there is innovation, but there is no KPI for innovation, I mean, it's my priority 500. I will deal with it once this huge pile of papers is gone, or you know, the email inbox is read through, and then I'll deal with it. And I'm not going to go for it before. Uh, Toby, and then, uh, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so one interesting thing is that uh, I, I think the, all this has to have really clear KPIs. Uh, but they, the KPIs cannot be different 
uh, than what they usually have, because then they have the scorecards or whatever, and, uh, and you, you don't have a startup-related scorecard. So, so what we do is that we look at the, uh, we pick the themes for the programs from the strategy or from whatever is, are their KPIs uh, otherwise. And then the people are sort of working towards the strategic goals when they're working with the startup. So it's not a separate activity. And, uh, and another thing, uh, so, so what we also do is that uh, we, we have only have on-site accelerators. So, so we bring the startups into the offices so that they can go and have coffee for 15 minutes. So it's not a separate thing that, okay, now I need to go to, uh, across the city to the startup space. But it's, it, they are sitting there. So you can go there anytime and just uh, uh, talk about, uh, just bounce around ideas. And uh, that's also working really well because then it's not a sort of separate thing that you have to prepare for. You can just, uh, okay, I'll just stop by and uh, have, a, have a chat with, with the guys or the girls. Okay. Hendrik, what? Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm listening. It has been very interesting. Uh, I think uh, cooperation with startup is no, diff no much different than any other cooperation. Mm -hmm. Only the counterpart, the startup, is a little bit more junior, might be, mm -hmm. or might think a little bit differently. And I think uh, that the most important is those large corporates treating those counterparties with a respect and with uh, understanding that uh, they should be listening and uh, being very, also what is very important not only like talking but including all this into the decision making process too so to be very open about uh, uh, their po potential partners about how things work in this house, like how decisions are made in mm. Telefonica, for mm. example, in this department on this sure. topic. Somebody needs to tell the startup or the potential partner. And uh, having a mentor, I think it's also very good because sometimes it's very clear in banks, in finance, it's very clear there is a bo board of decision makers appointed by the board of directors and then all the decisions are done there. It takes X amount of time and that kind of gaps has to be filled. Uh, probably it's same in every company in some, in corporate in some way. But uh, being very like respectful and open, I think that's the key of success. Would it be a separate department who is making sure that uh, let's, let's say all the team is really embracing the innovation or would it be achieved in some other means that probably depends but that's yeah. that's how i think yeah. about it you also have actually a great collaboration with apple which is one of the most innovative companies in the world as such and you started negotiating with them when you were very young I, i'm not even sure if your product was ready in the market when you started talking to them or the product was already in the market mm. what did that experience tell you or what did you learn from it apple as a lo <laughs> probably largest corporate of them all, or at least most of, one of the yeah. largest. Uh, I think Apple's success, they are, by the way, best brand in the world, uh, is that they embrace everything new. They are really, like all the team members, are really open, really open with their decision-making process, what you can and what you can't do with them from the first meeting and uh, also about what and how and how fast they will do it. So being very open has enabled us to launch basically with them. And uh, being very transparent about what we need to achieve to be successful in their eyes has also been the success story for, of Upgraded. Because Upgraded would be there, but without Apple, we wouldn't be so strong, or we would be in different place with Samsung, for example. How long did it yeah. take you to negotiate the contract with Apple? Just, I mean, to give an indication. It happened very fast. It happened uh, like uh, in a two months. It's oh. extremely fast. Christoph, you have also experience with collaborating with yes, telcos. Pain in the ass. No. <laughs> Depends. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that it's a little bit different. Uh, like, if there is a pinpoint which is there, and mm. uh, this is business critical for them, mm. it's so business critical, but they 
can't fi fulfill their goals if they're do not doing with us. So that has been the pain we have been healing. Probably if you are healing something which is not so obvious or they don't think about every day, it's not so easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Um, yeah. no, like Christoph the, answers and then... Like the two months is great. Um, <laughs> first contract was three, three and a half years with one MNO talking about negotiation, using data, stuff like that. It took on and on and on. That was no end at all. But we didn't know why they said no at the beginning. So it was <laughs> a technical issue, like talking, talking, talking. And at the end of it, it was just like we had to adapt our business case, like 5%. And then it's like, okay, great. We take that risk. <laughs> So it's, it was not a technical issue. This was something we did for years. And then we started really talking. And we, I didn't know why they refused and said no. But at the end of the day, it was just like, if we get to that point where that revenue like, goes over the risk, then we started. And it's three years. Like the second was a year. Now it's half a year. So it's, it's getting better. But the first contract was just like every day going to the office, trying to figure out why and what we have to change. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's annoying at some point. Like your employees are there like, do we have a contract? No. Like, it goes on for <laughs> three years. <laughs> Straightforward. Like, Xmas, like, whatever. But after three years, like, first contract, great. Like, celebrating, and then you go for the next one. So, but, but you're an exceptional startup then because you still survived within that three years. You yeah, know? but like, you're burning money for three years. Like, why? Like, we have a vision. We know that they want to make money, but getting to that point <laughs> takes time. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you, Maya. You're yeah. right. So I think uh, Henrik ha has it indeed. So that's the most important thing on the cooperation. Transparency, uh, open communication, and respect. And, and actually, I think that's the most important KPI. And uh, actually, that's the most important KPI for us. So what we do, we always um, uh, review the NPS, Net Promoter Score, from startups. For about 90%, 95% of the startups what I'm meeting, and I'm meeting about three to 400 uh, startups a year, uh, I say, no, we are not going to be a partner for you. And then we ask, by the way, would you like to recommend us to other startups? And they do actually recommend, if you do it uh, in a professional way. And, and personally, I always say that in the first meeting, in two weeks, we will make the decision whether we start the negotiations or not. However, that's only partly true. Then uh, at the same time, we want to emphasize that all are doing business with startups. And then yesterday, uh, we had to be here with <laughs> Henrik, and Henrik said, hey, listen, by the way, do you know Ville Valkama in, in your organization? I just contacted Ville on January. Not hearing anything from Ville after that. That's and the I, innovation spread in the organization, yeah, you know? It's yeah, spread yeah, so wide. I must say that he <laughs> replied to me. To yeah, yeah, but then, <laughs> then I was really that okay. And then it's the role for the be in the fire brigade. And then we had the meeting to this morning with Ville and, and, and made the decision about uh, how to proceed. I will tell you later on, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. But uh, you see, it's, it's a bumpy road. It's a bumpy road, but. Uh, Keep in mind, that's the most important thing for you, big organization. Think about the net promoting score, because if it's not the deal on the first time, it might be that it's a future Zuckerberg, right? Mm. If you're doing it in an unprofessional way, it won't be coming again with a cool thing, which is going to be a success. Yeah. And right? as Christoph mm. mentioned before, it's a black box. I guess you need to know the right person in that black box to yeah. talk to. If Hendrik had spoken with you in January, he might have had his answer already now. Yeah, <laughs> and my contact <laughs> information that's available publicly on the, um, our web pages, so <laughs> you can always contact me. Okay. Antea, you yeah, want to elaborate? If I can add something as well, I think it's uh, the problem of managing expectations, because it's hard, uh, uh, like, it's easy to have a meeting and promise things, but then, uh, as you were saying about transparency and being open, like sometimes uh, the communication is not so fluid between uh, companies and startups. So we have cases in which, uh, as well, there was a contract signed between a startup and uh, Telefonica in three months, but it was an uh, occasional case, which was great. It's a, a company called Rota Geek. What they do is they staff optimization. So if you're in a store and if uh, you want to take a day off, there is this platform where you can request for it. And then maybe a colleague of yours can uh, take the day for you. So you can just uh, accept. And then uh, the manager needs to approve it. So it's very easy to man manage the staff. Uh, so it was a kind of really clear fit. So in this case, it was a critical thing for Telefonica. Perfect thing. Actually, the founder is coming from the uh, health sector. So nothing to do with Telefonica, but still the same problems in different industries. 
So this can happen, but also on the other, in other times, maybe we had our startup traveling to Peru for Telefonica Peru, and then they were like, oh, great, we're signing a contract, and then uh, six months pass, and the contract is not ready, mm -hmm. they don't want to sign, they don't know what the problem is. So I think there is a strong uh, communication problem between uh, startups and corporates. And again, I think the really key thing is flexibility. So changing that 5% or that 10% in your business case, understanding what is the need in specific for that uh, corporate, for that team, and changing a bit your product. Because I think companies are very risk adverse, but the reason why they work with startups is because they're flexible. So they can adjust their solution to their needs. So understanding clearly what their needs are and then changing a bit your business case, your solution according to those needs is, is the key to succeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. w, totally. Think? Yeah, so, so I think really, really, really important points. And I, I uh, especially uh, what Kimo just said, uh, said about sort of, the, uh, sort of the transparency and also building the, uh, the trust, I think that's really important for corporates to understand that uh, they, they shouldn't go into working with startups with the, uh, the way they've uh, sort of, first of all, treated uh, outsourcing companies in the past. So they, they need to sort of adapt also their ways in order for that to, that to happen in, in a real way. Because in, in the end, uh, startups are uh, unpredictable unpredict and that's a good thing because then they can pursue, they are the, they are the un so you have to be, let them be entrepreneurs. You have to sort of uh, use the entrepreneurial drive because you know, it's a great force if you let them to be that. But if you um, put them into a box that, uh, hey, this is the way our uh, outsourcing companies uh, have always been uh, treated, you know, that's the only way we can, we can deal with you, then you're losing out on a lot of things. And then you're probably losing out in the things that you really are trying to get from the startups. So you have to also adapt as corporates to the uh, new ways of working. We've been now for the past 40, 50 <laughs> minutes already, we've yeah. been you know, putting the corporates in the mud. What about the startups? Are they really, you know, the stars and there is nothing bad about them? Or what is some of the ugly truth about the startups? Who wants take, to start? Take care. <laughs> oh, take the startups start. Start. <laughs> I got to uh, What I, since I, my last 15 years is being corporation with corporates daily basis. So that's why I think I know this topic quite well. And uh, I can talk about my mistakes in the past, which I have done, and that has enabled us to do some things right in the, so other times. So uh, being really, like, making it three years, it's very important. Because it's like, <laughs> it was a very good question from the probably largest bank of, in Europe uh, in, uh, two weeks ago, when we uh, started the discussion that, it was like, what if we are belly up as soon as we get started? Because the <laughs> problem with startup is it's so great, it looks so great, but what if you die fast? And that's, I, I just see sometimes that the corporates are like, it's a little bit like venture capitalists. Like, let's wait, see if you survive, then we take you seriously. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, that startups don't survive sometimes those, uh, those days. It's like, it's not corporate's fault. I would say that it's also like figuring the plan out, being prepared, having enough capital, doing a raises on right time, like being the strong partner for the uh, strong uh, operator or strong bank, because uh, that's what entrepreneurs should figure out themselves to carry the, like the other side. Of course, lot like, uh, Corporates keeping the promises what they act, uh, like make and actually sending the contract if they promise to send the contract. <laughs> it's kind of important. Can be helpful. <laughs> that can kill too. <laughs> but uh, most important, if you are taking a business risk, you should think it through and uh, you should have competence and you should gain trust. And you can't just say that it's basically coming with actions, coming, keeping the promises from the startup side first and then the promises from the other side should follow. And if they don't follow, then it's already something wrong with the corporate management as such. Mm -hmm. If I can... Yes, we, we have <laughs> one minute and 50 <laughs> seconds left. <laughs> I can quickly build on that. I think it's also about kind of trust from the startup world, kind of building trust, because it happens so many times. It's incredible that maybe we schedule a meeting with some, someone very senior, and then the startup doesn't show up. They were like, 
you were you had a meeting, why didn't you come? Oh no, I was busy building doing this or building the product. So like having very clear what your priorities are and if you have to kind of focus on building the product, then don't go and meet, you know, like just do things in, in the right stage. Otherwise, you lose this trust because sometimes it's hard to have those meetings. And if you have a meeting with someone senior, you need to be prepared and you need to be at the right time to have it as well. So kind of uh, uh, making companies trust you is very important as well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. There is no fire alarm anymore, so mm -hmm. <laughs> but we still cannot continue. Uh, the next panel is coming up. Thank you all. I guess to summarize it up, I would say, based on the discussion that we had, we brought out a lot on the corporate side, of course. And uh, at the end, we finally got to the startup side. We can continue next year on the startup <laughs> side. Um, and we also have at uh, actually 12 o'clock, there will be a workshop, especially for the corporate, so we can continue with the corporates. Uh, but to summarize it up, what we have also seen that with the matchmaking ventures in the market is that the biggest misalignment between the collaboration is the fact that the corporates and startups don't look at them as a partner, as an equal partner. And this is from both ends. Startups not showing up to the meeting or expecting the answers too early. I mean, if you want to collaborate, get to know your partner from both ends and commit to it. That's the only way to do it. And also from the corporate side, you need to make sure that you really commit end to end. When it comes to M&A deals, or the M&A world, what do we see? The minute M&A deal is done, that's when the corporate starts exercising very heavily, making sure that the integration works, making sure that everything works. With the startups, the contract is signed. The first time there is some obstacle on the road, oh, can we go back on this contract? We don't need this contract anymore. So it's really commitment, but the same kind of commitment on the startup side. We need to understand that corporates have the access to the market, they understand the market. So startups should not be very nose up so that the rain drops into your nose because you think you know everything. You don't know. You know about the technology. You are able to uh, develop in an agile mode, but you do not know about the market as much as the corporate does. So put these two things together. For the corporate, get the startups to give you the technology and innovation. And for startups, get the corporate to give you the access to the market and the knowledge about the market. So it's a partnership, not a one-side story. Well, thank you all. Golden words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>